Good morning, everybody. I like the music, but uh, good morning, everyone. Uh, Mike Gower, it's a pleasure to have all of you. There are over 300 of you online right now. Uh, welcome to the first Finance Town Hall of uh, this calendar year. Uh, we have a great uh, agenda for you today. Uh, and on top of that, uh, we are going to have, uh, we're going to try and ask the expert sessions in, in Zoom rooms uh, afterwards. Uh, when we were doing these in person, we gather in the back of the room, different topical areas and so on. So we're trying the Zoom version of that today. I hope that will be uh, that'll be useful for you. Um, let's go forward here. Before we begin, we're recording. Um, you all are on mute. If you have questions, please use the Q and A function. Uh, you can also uh, use the chat. We'll be monitoring both and we will address questions at the end of each of the presentations. Next. Next. So here's today's agenda. And uh, in a moment, I'll introduce Kimberly, hopefully, uh, who's going to talk about uh, the foundation and its relationship with the university. Following that, Jason McDonald, from our chief investment officer, talk about the long-term investment pool and how that fits into uh, things that we do here. And then David Moore, our chief budget officer, will be uh, talking about the fiscal 22 forecast and where we think we're gonna end this year. So it is my great pleasure to introduce my friend and colleague, uh, Kimberly Hopley. Kimberly came to Rutgers in October Prior to joining Rutgers, Kimberly was Senior Vice President and Chief Development Officer at the ASU Foundation at Arizona State University, her alma mater, where they completed a comprehensive fundraising campaign totaling $2.35 billion. In her six years at ASU, Kimberly helped to triple the annual fundraising, create professional development and promotional opportunities for her team and instituted a leadership caucus to encourage and invest in diversity, equity, and inclusion. And I just want to really emphasize what a partnership that I have personally with Kimberly and what a partnership between uh, University Finance Administration and the Rutgers University Foundation uh, and how strong and important that is to this institution. But um, I'd like to say that uh, Kimberly and I have become fast friends and fast partners in crime. So without further ado, Kimberly, welcome to the Finance Town Hall. Thank you so much, Mike. And what a thrill to be able to um, share some um, aspects of the foundation, kind of give you an overview of where we're going and, and just talk to people who are in uh, the same business in, in essence of thinking about the financial health of an institution that we care deeply about and to advance the mission. Um, you all understand it takes resources to do that. And you know some of it is resources coming in, some of it is resources that um, need to be conserved. And, and so I do wanna share with you um, philosophically where I'm coming from um, as we partner together, because it truly is, um, Mike, Mike is not kidding, we are, um, we truly are aligned and, and uh, between the two of us feel that um, we can work together to make sure that we are advancing the institution in the appropriate way. Um, I say to him often, uh, we will not bend the institution to the will of a donor. And um, you will have in me a partner that uh, seeks to find solutions to bring people into our world who care about what Rutgers is trying to achieve and, and we bring them in to advance our mission. And if that aligns, that money spends well. Uh, and we also need to be very mindful that the university um, is, is looking 
uh, before I fundraise for something that we're looking at what is the sustainability of that project, that center, that institute, so that we can understand clearly the role of philanthropy, which tends to be to start things and expand things, um, but not always sustain. And so kind of the discipline to make sure that what we're fundraising for uh, is reflective of what the institution wants to accomplish. So let me begin and kind of give you a high level. Uh, if Slide one, please. So uh, just to let you know that part of the clarifying, evolving, and aligning with the university, the Rutgers Foundation is demonstrating that there are parallels between what the university is trying to achieve through the Holloway administration um, and then what those parallels are on the university. So you can see where he, Jonathan, would say academic excellence. We are looking at the pursuit of excellence with our own organization, institutional clarity, organizational clarity, beloved community, a culture of respect and trust. Next slide. Um, so I'm a big fan of the, you know, why, what, how. Uh, I think it, it works really well to clarify our purpose. So the foundation since October, literally, uh, I came on the 11th, the 18th, uh, we began working on clarifying our purpose, our culture, our functional framework. So our purpose is to advance Rutgers. This is not just through philanthropic support. This is also through engaging and activating an alumni base who want to find pride in the institution. Uh, they want to find a sense of belonging and they want to do meaningful things through Rutgers. These are really important assets, over 550,000 alums who can help us achieve our mission sometimes through giving, but other times through internships, um, opening doors, uh, and, and activating other alums. Um, but everything we do should be to advance the mission of Rutgers. Um, our way, we are adopting a culture of radical responsibility. These three descriptors, responsive, respectful, reflective. Um, I would ask all of you, uh, it's a process. Uh, it's something we're committing to. I think every day about how do we implement these behaviors that are just as important to me as the outcomes, the way we show up to work. Um, it will take time as this has not been the emphasis. And, um, and I invite, if you're not experiencing that, um, I want the feedback because I would see that as useful in helping us understand where we could be more reflective of these areas. Finally, just to understand fundamentals, uh, breaking down again, form follows function. So what are those key functions that the university needs the foundation and, and alumni engagement to perform? So you will see those broken down there. Um, next slide, please. So this is a little bit of the how. Uh, part of what we're aligning our institutional or organizational structure to accomplish uh, will be realized in a comprehensive campaign. So many of you may have heard about this. It is still evolving. Uh, there has been good solid work done, but uh, in this leg, we are pre-public launch. And so it is so important that we clarify uh, what the purpose of the campaign is, which is not about the foundation. Uh, I will utilize the opportunity of a comprehensive campaign to build in the infrastructure and align uh, our organization so that we can accomplish this. And if you can imagine if there was a logo on the campaign and one day you just take the logo off, all of the gift agreement templates, everything that we need to build um, is, is going to be important uh, in just our ongoing operations. But a campaign is really about shining a light on the university. So the stage we're at now is understanding 
what is important to the university? And I, I say, what is the persona, the character, the ethos of the university that makes it distinct and where we want to invite people, not just alums, anyone who cares about our mission and purpose into our world. So you will see on the bottom some emerging themes. Those may sound a lot like you know any institution, but I want to elaborate just a bit. Um, and again, this is not determined yet. This is we're still socializing this. Um, but I'd be interested if this rings true for you. So in access to education, what I'm hearing the institution say is inclusive access uh, for students to Rutgers with an aspiration to be a national model for social mobility, educational equity by supporting the whole person while they are at Rutgers um, and meaningful engagement post-graduation. So it's really talking, if I were to distill it down in a belief statement, I would say Rutgers believes um, in human beings have the having the opportunity to realize their full potential. Um, and that when they're here, we take that very seriously. Um, beloved community, actually, it has meanings for us internally as, as a Rutgers family, but externally, uh, it, it's starting to shape as building a culture that models and facilitates good citizenship and recognizes that Rutgers is a representative our, of our democracy and, a, and the growing diversity of our country. So service, um, uh, you know, how we understand our role as citizens in not just the democracy, but in the world. Those will be important themes. And then finally, the common good, which is where we can focus on Rutgers Health, uh, the research that we do as an R1 research institution, um, to improve the quality of life for the people in New Jersey, but uh, as we all know, well outside uh, just the state of New Jersey, but also this is a, a, an important area for our land grant institution status, our extension services, where, you know, there is a constant curation of knowledge and then mobilizing it so that it can be accessed widely. Um, my job is to build kind of a broad community support uh, internal to Rutgers, uh, internal to the Rutgers alumni family, but also externally, again, for people who would care about these things and how we're trying to accomplish it. Um, I think that you will see consistency will be important for us in messages that are causal. And I wanna just say one thing, um, there is a tendency to use the term priorities and you're not gonna hear priorities from the foundation. You are going to hear all about those pillars, who is Rutgers, and those inclusive areas where we can speak to Rutgers from a, uh, what is a university-wide level, uh, what is a chancellor-led unit, or something similar level of how that is actualized, expressed, uh, how do does each college and school um, express those those causes, themes, pillars, and then down to every program. So what we will begin to do is have within the institution self-identifying, where do they see themselves primarily identifying? Is it access to education? Is it the citizenship uh, focus uh, in a beloved community? Is it common good? And then what we will do is for a $10 donor, a $100 million donor, we will begin to express the impact of the collective Rutgers uh, at that, again, at that high level in those areas, steward them collectively, but also make a space for everyone to be included. So if we guide people into, as we invite people and guide them into our world, uh, they can go to a program that expresses it you know, in the corner of an institution, uh, but we, we have to kind of create these pathways that are logical for external people to understand who Rutgers is and why. So it is inclusive, not exclusive. And if we focus on mission and we focus on who we are, um, that's where I'm confident that the ability to create and um, express these 
uh, how Rutgers solves for these things will actually spur others in our institution to advance Rutgers in that way. So that's, that's kind of a summary of where we are, where we started from, philosophically where I'm coming from, from a finance perspective, being at the table early so we can understand the needs, sharing with you what we think philanthropy can do so finance teams can make decisions about whether we should go forward with things or not, and then being inclusive uh, while not holding the institution hostage to a donor's wishes and uh, making sure that it is what it is we need to do and accomplish. So I'll stop there. Thank you, Kimberly. I, I think that it's uh, it's very clear the foundation is pointing in a in a new direction and and really uh, really behind the the president's uh, directions as well. Um, we, we've got some questions. Uh, I'll start with one. Uh, I know how just from my personal experience with you how excited you've been about coming here. What what have you what have you seen that surprised you in in a delightful way? You know, mm. do you have an example of something that the university has done that, that uh, is doing that uh, is really uh, spectacular? There's there, and, and in complete candor, the brand of Rutgers is so strong. It's a global brand. It is um, outside of New Jersey, there is such a compelling um, theme of excellence, of kind of embracing the challenges of a part of the country that is um, um, really a leading indicator of where the United States is going and the world is going. Um, and I have found that it's, it's more true than I think sometimes within the institution they believe is true. Um, maybe you're just used to having things at a high level. Maybe you're just used to, um, oh, we grew up down the street or we've worked here. Um, I think the delight is really seeing that there's a lot of there there. Um, I am so proud to highlight what Rutgers is doing. Um, and I come from a place that is the scale of, of where I just came from is larger and complex. So I see the complexity as assets, I see there are many strengths there. And I understand the journey that we're on to kind of um, move in a cohesive way, but still demonstrate uh, unique and distinct aspects to the campuses um, and Rutgers. So I'm, I'm enjoying partnering with many of you uh, and, and your colleagues in this, but that's been the biggest, that it's really, Rutgers really is better than I thought it was. Thanks. Um, reminder to the audience, uh, you can uh, put questions into the chat or the Q&A function. Uh, Stephanie, we have it lined up some? We do. We do. Thank you. Uh, we have two questions. The first is, is the endowment helping with the new program regarding free tuition? Is the endowment helping with a new program? So. Um, there are, you know, I'm not sure what specifically it's referencing, but maybe what I can assume is uh, if, it, if it's a program like Scarlet Grants, uh, there are endowed funds that yield, uh, obviously yield some dividends that are put into a current use fund as they, as those funds grow. I mean, the power of endowment is perpetuity but it also helps grow how we are able to meet the needs currently. Um, and I think for, if we're talking about Scarlet, a guarantee, that is going to take active fundraising uh, uh, in addition to anything else that uh, the institution is able to identify uh, in, in order to bridge that, that gap. And, and I would encourage you that I have been surprised with the reception of um, New Brunswick's kind of answer to this and, uh, you know, run to the top in Newark, bridging the gap in Camden have been very successful. 
Uh, again, I think because the identity of Rutgers, people see Rutgers as a place where all are welcome and they are given an opportunity to experience something unique in this part of the country. Um, and then they have the opportunity to, to work hard, but to realize that promise. Uh, so there may be a role I would defer to Jason on and Mike Gower on how those funds are used, but I would just say, I intend that we will also be needing to actively fundraise for that because it's, it's still a, a, a hefty price tag. Okay, great, thank you. Uh, our next question, in terms of philanthropy, is the foundation doing anything to fight food insecurity within the Rutgers community, um, i.e. among students and staff? Yes, well, thank you. I mean, that it's troubling. It's troubling that, um, but not surprising. Um, I think that reflects that whole person that we, you know, fundamentally we are responsible uh, for students when they come to Rutgers. I've heard some students say, you become my household, you become my family. Um, we need to learn from you. We need to feel safe and secure. Uh, there are a lot of programs that are terrific. Uh, the food pantries, there's some active programs on every campus. What I have found interesting is we have some key donors who have invested heavily in this area who are now asking for us to facilitate with the university some comprehensive conversations about what does that entire ecosystem look like? Are we looking at uh, food waste from vendors? Are we thinking about this more holistically? They are willing to invest, but um, I, I think also wanting to make sure that Rutgers, not just New Brunswick, but every campus is looking at this as, you know, what are the other assets that we have that should flow into building food security so that we're not just having food pantries? And then where is the dignity for the student? How are we making sure this is something that, um, as we would for foster youth and others, the sensitivities to not call it out? Um, and I would also add, we have some strong partners. I'll just say one is the Hillel Center uh, in New Brunswick, where they feed students every day. Um, so it's also not just looking at what is happening on our campus and uh, through those programs that we are directly activating, but embracing our community partners who uh, have that heart for our students. But how do we create that ecosystem and really build that in? And again, in a campaign mode, this would be under that inclusive access because it's not just access, it's we want them to finish. We want uh, healthy people to finish the journey with us. So yes, we're doing that. Um, we're currently fundraising, but I think there's a bigger story here that we can help facilitate because donors are interested in solving the bigger picture. Wonderful, thank you. Uh, our next question is, is the foundation willing to assist the surrounding New Brunswick community in fighting environmental racism? For example, situations like the relocation of the Lincoln Annex Elementary School. You know, I'm not familiar with that particular um, example, but I, I would point us back to the purpose of the foundation. Uh, the purpose of the foundation, our why is to advance Rutgers. Um, if, if we're doing our job right, we become uh, a conduit for people to do something meaningful through Rutgers. And so, again, I would not have a donor drive what Rutgers wants to do or doesn't want to do. But if this is something that is important to Rutgers and there is fundraising needed or um, in any area, um, then that's my job to be responsive to that. I have, you know, essentially one partner in this, and that is uh, Rutgers University. Great. Thank you. Uh, our next question, how has the foundation had to adapt to the challenges of fundraising in a COVID-19 world? Well, um, I think you all would agree there's been, you know, this is something we wouldn't wish on, on society again. Uh, but I would also add that uh, 
in the nonprofit sector in general, and then from my experience in bringing this to Rutgers University Foundation, social disruption is real and we can expect that it will happen. Um, it may not happen for the same reasons like a pandemic. Um, my tendency is to lean in. Uh, when, when there is stress on a university, uh, in, in and missional has to keep going. And uh, I think decisions were made all across the country and the world. Do you continue to fundraise? Do you respect uh, that people have a lot going on and back off? Um, my, I think we lean in. I think people wanted a reason to help others. They needed an avenue. Did the messaging change? In the crisis, absolutely. But I think of it like an emergency response. There's the, you know, the, the crisis that happens. There's the emergency at hand where we, you should be asking people, again, it's up to them if they want to give, but, but we want to create a pathway for people who feel the need to respond. There's kind of then the recovery mode, which is a very different uh, sense. It takes more thought. It's long-term. Um, so there's kind of response, recovery, and then I think we're in that space now where we're transitioning into that strategic mode of how do we buffer um, from another social disruption. And so everywhere on that continuum, I see unique donors who would want to contribute to help workers um, in that scenario. Um, and so, yes, it changed, like with all of you all of a sudden we can reach a donor uh, in a Zoom call. It has helped us actually get more access to donors, uh, but it also reinforced the importance of sharing meals, being in front of donors, getting on a plane and having the conversation, making sure faculty, uh, deans, the president, cabinet members are in front of donors. Thank you. Our next question is regarding the land grant reference. What is the foundation looking into implementing? Well, I, I, I think it's such an, you know, the, um, we'll just say the extension, the aspects of the extension, uh, the public good there is so incredible. Uh, from just an initial blush, are we using those assets uh, to engage alumni and donors? Are we hosting things in a, you know, it, to show them, like, here's an expression of what we're doing and here's how it benefits the community. And it's also a nice, lovely way to have an event or a reception. Um, so I think first of all, is just highlighting it and then understanding in that nature of common good. I don't think we tell the story enough. I don't think that we're talking about um, owning that seat of Rutgers, the you know university, uh, and and the role we have in the state uh, as, as again adding that public value. Um, I would add that even in the research space, I'm encouraging uh, the grants that we are helping submit, the fundraising that comes through philanthropy foundations. That what is that aspect? of if we're getting funds to support, um, let's just say, let's use COVID. If, if it's a post-pandemic clinic, um, we're obviously helping patients and helping the community. But as an R1 institution, we should also be saying, um, these are key factors in what makes a post-COVID clinic successful. And then what is the mechanism to share that with every federally qualified community health center, every health system, every school district, so that they can figure out how to deploy that in context of their scope of work. So I think the extension and our research give us tremendous opportunities to talk about the, the value that we bring um, economically and every other way to, to New Jersey. Um, so actively fundraising, but also promoting it because one of our largest investors is still the state of New Jersey. And that's important for us to continue to show value back to New Jersey. Excellent. And our last question for now is, have you had to adjust to the New Jersey weather compared to Arizona? Well, okay, this is going to sound weird, but um, I... 
I understand this has been a fairly mild winter because I keep going like, is this it? Is this all you, is this as much as, you know, um, I love it. it for somebody that has, I, I spent some time in the Northwest. So seasons were like gray and rain and then perfect for maybe three months. Um, and I have to say this, New Jersey is a very warm place. Uh, I think whatever this, kind of um, narrative around New Jersey. Sure, there's some sharp elbows, but I, as I've shared with people, there's also like, we're gonna nudge you with a sharp elbow. There's like a heads up and it's kind of your bad if you don't move out of the way. Um, and I just find it to be a beautiful place. It is a beautiful state. Um, I, I'm so proud to be here. Um, anyone that knows me personally is, is feels like I belong here more than, I just somehow landed in Arizona, but I, I identify strongly as it, uh, someone that the, the New Jersey feels like home to me. And I love every aspect of the four seasons. It's, it's amazing. That's wonderful yep. to hear. Back to you, Mike. Yeah, Kimberly, I'm for one, I'm so happy that you are with us here. And uh, thank you for joining the town hall today. I uh, really appreciate it. We have uh, 425 people on right now, which is a good good uh, swath of the university. So uh, thanks again for uh, being with us. And, and, and our next speaker, this is uh, you know, balanced very well. We're, we're going from Kimberly who raises endowment funds to Jason McDonald, uh, our chief investment officer, who then uh, puts them to, uh, makes, makes them grow and puts them to use. So uh, turn it over to Jason. Thanks, Mike, and um, thanks for everyone to joining today. Um, if we could move on to the to the first slide, um, and you could just put them all down. Uh, just for everyone, I think I've spoken at a couple of these before. People have heard from me, um, but just giving everybody a little bit of background, um, I joined the university uh, almost six years ago. Um, born and raised in New Jersey. Uh, went to school here, uh, first generation college student, um, and uh, you know, feel very fortunate about being back here at, um, at my state university. Um, and we started the investment office uh, almost six years ago, so it's been a. We'll, we'll hear a little bit more about it, but um, it's uh, been you know. Thank thank you for having me, and been very fortunate for this opportunity. Um, so I'm going to try to dovetail a lot of uh, what what Kimberly said, and um, just kind of start from the start from scratch. You know, how do we coexist with the foundation? Uh, the foundation raises money for a lot of different things. One of those things are endowments. Um, a lot of it's for current use. So uh, Kimberly mentioned the Scarlet Promise grants. Um, there's a portion of Scarlet Promise grants that get raised. Um, to be used immediately, um, and and they need to be. Um, but there's also uh, a portion of Scarlet Promise grants that are raised as endowments um, that are, um, you know, a portion, to, and we'll talk a little bit about this later, a portion taken out every year to support uh, that cause, but also grow for the long term so they're around forever to uh, support that cause. So, um, you know, wanted to level set and say the foundation and Kimberly's group, they raise all the money for us for endowments and, and we, uh, we invest it. So uh, sometimes I talk to folks and, and they, um, uh, sometimes they'll be confused on what they think it's just one big pool of capital and we can kind of do whatever we want from a usage standpoint. Um, really not the case. The endowment is, uh, we view it as a pool from an investment standpoint, but it's made up of over 2,500 individual endowments uh, given by donors for specific uh, causes. So research, um, scholarships, et cetera. Um, and they, we are here to support the current needs of the university and also grow for the long term. So, um, you know, hopefully the university and this endowment is around for a lot longer than uh, you and I are. Uh, so every year, that short-term piece, the current needs, we spend uh, about, we take off about 4% uh, 
of a three-year rolling market value average um, to support every individual endowment um, for whatever purpose they've been created for. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, I just want to talk about a little bit about the governance structure. Um, we, I report to Mike, uh, and I also report to the Joint Committee on Investments. Uh, Joint Committee on Investments is made up of eight members, four from the Board of Governors and four from the Board of Trustees. Um, we have a staff of four people, and we also uh, utilize a consultant to work as an extension of staff for us. Next slide, please. A little bit more on the team. So you can see the four people on staff in the above. Um, and what one thing I'm really proud of, we had this idea when, when I first joined, I, um, I never thought it was gonna turn out this way and hopefully we can keep the momentum going, but it's been a lot of fun um, working with students, um, meeting a lot of students and also helping them, you know, while they're here and, and as they move on. So uh, as you can see, we have uh, quite a healthy group of uh, current interns. Um, we try to find these interns freshman or sophomore year and keep them until they graduate. Most of the time they'll, they'll go out for the summer and get internships somewhere else and come back to us when school's in session. Um, and you can see that you know, we've had some interns that have uh, graduated from the program move on to some, some pretty good uh, jobs within um, the, the asset management investment industry. And um, you know, this is something we want to continue to do. Uh, we want to, uh, we, we try to help not only our interns, but also other students that uh, reach out to us and ask for advice. Um, and, and uh, you know, it's been a really fulfilling part of the job. We have five new interns, in our new summer cohort starting uh, in late May. And, um, you know, the one thing I'll say about, you can go back for a second, um, I'll probably spend too much time on the intern part. Um, during COVID, um, we had an opportunity. We always wanted to take Newark and Camden interns, but we never had the opportunity because they could never get here. So when COVID started, I said, well, everybody's on Zoom now, so we really don't have an excuse. So uh, we, we re reached out to folks in Newark and Camden and, and uh, interviewed a bunch of uh, folks. We have one student from Newark now and one student from Camden, and um, we have one new one coming in from Newark and uh, hopefully another one from Camden soon. So. Um, you know, something that we're trying, trying to be inclusive of all the campuses. Um, next slide, please. Uh, just a little bit on, you know, when we joined, when I joined, I, I wanted to make this, uh, you know, I knew, uh, I knew Rutgers well, uh, come, going to school here. And um, I never knew we had an endowment when I was here. Uh, I probably wasn't looking that hard either. Uh, but um, we wanted to be a part of the university. I think what we do with interns, what we do speaking to classes um, is part of that. And, um, you know, how do we want to handle ourselves? We want to act with integrity, act with humility, and, um, you know, be flexible and have an open mind and, and keep that kind of hungry chip on your shoulder, uh, Rutgers, New Jersey attitude. Uh, next slide, please. And so, here are our objectives again, short-term needs, long-term growth. Um, how do we get, what do we need to get there and to achieve that long-term growth? It's about 7% over a long-term period. So uh, if you factor in our 4% payout every year, um, inflation and fees and expenses, uh, that's kind of how we get to a little over 7% number. Um, as you'll see later in some of our performance slides, uh, we've been um, uh, we've been doing well at that recently, and uh, hopefully we can continue that momentum. Um, you know, the one other thing I would say is like, how do we get there? What are the success factors that are critical to that? Having a long-term mindset. Um, if markets going down, um, markets going down. You know, the beginning of this year. That's an opportunity for us. That's an opportunity for us to buy. We're investing for forever. 
um, having the right culture and mindset, intellectual curiosity and open-mindedness, um, being mindful of our liquidity, um, and also having um, the pro diversification, proper asset allocation for us to meet those uh, over 7% um, return goals. Next slide, please. And, and this is how we do it. This is how the asset allocation works. This is what we think is gonna uh, move us in the right direction. We made a good amount of changes when I first got here. Um, we moved more into private assets. Um, private equity used to be around 10% of the portfolio. Now it's uh, over 20. Um, a lot of that, a lot of, a lot of that is, um, due to positive performance in that area. Um, and, um, you know, the other big changes are kind of uh, increasing capital to emerging markets. And we think with this um, portfolio um, mix, um, we're well positioned to um, achieve our, our goals. Next slide, please. So where has this gotten us? Um, with the new Nakubo rankings that just came out for fiscal year 21, uh, we moved up from number 74 in the country to number 69. Um, our, uh, as you can see, last year was a fantastic year, probably the best year ever for the endowment, um, where we we're up almost 36% last year. Um, and that's been, that was pretty good compared to our peers, as you can see, some of the different um, Nakubo, um, you know, averages. Uh, the one thing I will point to, which I'm really proud of, is, uh, you know, the five-year number, it's an annualized return, um, that 12%, uh, um, you can see how it translates into the, um, the growth of the, of the long-term investment pool uh, at the bottom and you know, how that's, you know, we're a little under $2 billion today, which is uh, fantastic from the, you know, uh, about 950 when we, uh, when we started in 2016. Uh, next slide, please. And this is just pretty much the same thing. You know, how does that performance translate into spending and into those, uh, that 4% uh, spend that goes to, to support all those individual endowments every year. And, um, you know, it's been really, really healthy growth. And, um, you know, hopefully we can continue uh, this momentum, you know, almost $60 million was, uh, will be contributed to the, um, uh, to the budget this year through uh, the endowment spend. Next slide, please. Um, and then just last thing, you know, ultimate goals. Best course suggested returns possible, um, foster the right culture and contribute positively to the university community. Um, I think, you know, our day job and, and what we're doing on the intern side is, you know, moving us in the right direction, but always can do better. Um, with that, I'll open up to any questions if there are any. Thank you, Jason. I, uh turn to Stephanie in a minute if we have any questions. Um, just want to put into um, context, um, this the $60 million is uh, a lot of money, um, but it represents about less than one and a half percent of our operating budget. Um, it is hugely impactful for the programs that it supports. Uh, but at an institution of our age, um, you would expect to have a much larger endowment. Um, but that depends on fundraising. That depends on the things that Kimberly is going to be focused in. You know, one of her goals is to get Jason more money to invest. And uh, I think that's an important piece there. So uh, to consider. Stephanie, do we have questions for Jason? We do. We have uh, one question for now. Um, Jason, would you please share what types of investments are identified to meet the 7% return goals? So if you go back to slide 16 real quick. That's possible. Um, so we review our asset allocation every year. 
um, and, and do an analysis. Um, we changed this a few years ago. We're twe we tweak a little bit here and there, um, but we really think this long-term target um, uh, column in the middle is are the, the, the weights um, for the type of assets um, that'll get us to that, that long-term goal. The one thing I didn't mention that I probably should have is um, we are, we don't invest in individual stocks and bonds, right? We, so within all of these categories, we partner with investment managers from all over the world um, and try to partner with, with uh, the best ones um, in order to, to achieve um, the returns that we need. Thank you. Uh, our next question is, do you have a fiduciary responsibility? Uh, my jumbo CD is now giving me 0.6%. I can't do anything about the jumbo CD, uh, unfortunately, but we are fiduciary um, to the university and the indefinite sense. Um, and, uh, I mean, I think the CD rates should be going up um, given what's gone on over the, over the last few months. Our next question, um, and I believe our last question for now is the intern program is a great idea. Um, is it competitive and what are the qualifications? Um, it's very competitive. It's amazing the amount of solicitations I get uh, just in my inbox from students looking for interviews for the program. Um, you know, we get, a, we get a ton of referrals from existing interns, um, just inbounds from students that know about the program. I've actually even gotten, um, I, I've, I've even gotten in emails from seniors in high school looking for interviews before they get <laughs> uh, to school here. So, um, you know, I, I, on a qualification standpoint, I think we're just looking for um, intellectually curious people um, that, that want to learn. I had the great pleasure of uh, just having breakfast with the interns before this, and uh, they're a terrific group. Um, I'm, I'm very, uh, it, it, it makes you feel really good about the quality of students who are coming through and that intellectual curiosity that they, uh, that Jason was just talking about. So thank you very much, Jason. I appreciate you uh, going through this uh, overview of, of the investment uh, today. Want to switch to uh, David Moore, Associate VP and Chief Budget Officer to talk about the current year uh, budget and forecast and, and some uh, considerations for that. Uh, David, go right to it. Thank you, Mike. And good morning to everyone that is joining the town hall. Uh, today I want to compare or we'll compare the FY22 approved budget as it relates to the mid-year and forecast for this year. Let's go to the next slide. So the FY22 approved budget is a 4.8 billion a budget that reflects the values of the university and it's fulfilling its core priorities of teaching, research, public service, and clinical care. The budget reflects a statement of the university's priorities while providing a recognition of our financial limitations that we have all been facing. Next slide. The budget spend, spending authority of 4.8 billion allows the university to spend on things that are most important to us. The budget allocates almost 70% on our core mission of student instruction, research, public service, and patient care that includes some of the following. Classroom instructions and academic support costs, which includes faculty compensation, staff support for academic units, uh, libraries, dean's offices. This accounts for approximately 1.5 billion or 32% of the budget. Student services and scholarship costs uh, within that, those core missions, which includes uh, financial aid, admissions, and social and cultural events for students, which accounts for 600 million or 12.4% of the budget. Moving into uh, the research side on our uh, other sponsor research programs and activities costs, which includes funds spent on research and other sponsor activities associated with federal, state, and non-government grants and contracts, which accounts for approximately 631 million or 
uh, percent of the budget. And rounding out the uh, core missions is the public service, extension, and patient care costs, which includes our cultural extension programs, delivery of health care, support of health clinics, and community services provided throughout the state it accounts for over $982 million, or 20.4% of the budget. Together, these types of costs come under the core missions of the uh, what is the student instruction, research, public service, and patient care that accounts for approximately 3.7 billion or almost 78% of the approved budget. The next category is the general administration costs, which includes support for central administration offices such as research, finance, human resources, procurement, and legal. This accounts for slightly over 481 million or 10% of the budget. In addition, this category includes operation and maintenance costs, which represents all Rutgers buildings and facilities, and includes costs for insurance, fuel, upkeep, and utility costs that account for $217 million, or 4.5% of the annual budget. Again, together, these two uh, above-mentioned types are, are really coming together to represent the administration and operation and maintenance of the university budget, which accounts for almost $700 million of the approved budget or 14.5%. The next category, which is auxiliary enterprises, includes costs associated with housing, dining, as well as parking operations. These operations account for approximately 231 million or 4.8% of the approved budget. And then the last category we have here is athletics, which, which uh, has costs associated with the 24 men's and women's division one sports programs at Rutgers New Brunswick and accounts for about 2.8% of the approved budget. Next slide, please. Thank you. Now that we're kind of grounded in the approved budget and expenses um, for the FY22, when we look at the actual through December forecast forward, we find that the overall total compensation expense uh, budget and this kind of gives you some historical view as well to see where the university was compared to its budget in December. Now, the overall total compensation expense category is trailing behind prior year expenses. This is primarily due to position vacancies across the universities, across the university, and uh, also uh, connected to that is uh, the fact that, uh, like many workforce se sectors, uh, the university has seen more than anticipated retirements and attrition. Uh, levels that come out at a time when filling those vacancies are taking longer, which results in a more, more than anticipated uh, total compensation expense savings. As we view the other expense categories, most are starting to return to a pre-pandemic level as students, faculty, and staff return to campuses. This is true with the exception of scholarships and fellowships and travel. When we look at scholarships and fellowships and expensing that we is experienced a higher than anticipated increase. We've seen this kind of over the last couple of years, and this is uh, really directly due to the receiving of one-time federal relief funds that were used to provide emergency financial aid to our Rutgers students, and we're, in, and we're anticipated, uh, we're in, impacted by the, the pandemic. Travel, on the other hand, has not, been, has not rebound to pre-pandemic levels, and its variance is directly associated with the lingering impacts of the pandemic has had on our business travels. Next slide. So we've talked about the expense. Let's talk about the revenue that uh, supports that expense. So where does the 4.8 billion uh, approved budget come from? Approximately 29% of our revenues come from tuition and fees. Patient care services include revenues from governmental payers and private insurers. For patient care across, uh, for, for patient care accounts for approximately 22% of the annual revenue budget. Almost 19% of the university's revenues come from the state of New Jersey through operating revenues and restricted funds uh, that support a portion of the university's fringe benefits cost. Uh, sponsored research, including grants and contracts from federal, state, and non governmental entities and makes up, makes up approximately 14% of the overall total revenues, while miscellaneous, miscellaneous sources, uh, which includes student aid, auxiliary enterprises, athletics, endowment and investment income, account for 15% of the revenues. And rounding out the sources of revenues for the FY22 budget, 
this approximately 1.5 in one-time federal relief funds. Next slide. Again, when we review kind of the mid-year numbers, we can see that most revenue sources are on track with the approved university budget source uh, budget and total revenues is slightly above prior year experience when, which is primarily due to receiving the federal student emergency aid uh, through the American Rescue Plan Act. Uh, this fund was used to provide, as, as I shared, emergency financial aid awards to students who were impacted by the pandemic. These additional revenues are offset by similar increases that we saw in the previous slides. Next slide. Our FY22 uh, quarter two forecast for Rutgers University reflects a year in positive position of just over or just under 1% of the total uh, annual budget. This favorable variance is primarily the result of the overall projected expense savings in the total compensation and is a direct result of having more uh, than anticipated uh, position vacancies and delays in hiring those positions. Next slide. As we round out kind of the, the calendar for budget development in FY23, just want to give you a little update where we're at. So leaving the 22 budget and moving into the 23 budget development, we are rounding out the development cycle to the final budget, which will be gathered over the next, uh, next few weeks. The University Budget Office will be reviewing the unit's budgets and consolidating the final budget to be presented to uh, the Board of Governors in, 